this is about the danger of seeking to disprove Christianity. Um, I, I really mean that. Now, I want to take this and have a nuanced view of this topic, but the danger, basically, in seeking to disprove Christianity is that you find what you want. Uh, people often just find what they want. Now, I'm not talking here about people who have sincere questions and they're genuinely seeking. Like, I really am trying to find truth. I'm talking about a different person when you add on to that an element of, and man, I really don't want this thing to be true. That is a spiritually dangerous position. And we're going to talk about how Jesus responds to those who ultimately are pretending they want evidence. Maybe they even think they want evidence. They think it's real, that this is what they're seeking. Um, but this is like a plague on the internet. I don't know if you've noticed. But I've done plenty of witnessing and sharing with people where when they ask tough questions and then they get good, what are really are good answers, not just pat answers, good answers to tough questions. And you realize they liked the question better than the answer. And so they just change the subject, right? When, when I get a, a questioner who gets a good answer and they're, they're actually more bothered with an answer than they are with silence, uh, that, that's when I'm like, okay, what's going on? This is uh, giving us an understanding of stubborn unbelief and what we can do about it. And because I'm, I'm amazed as I read this passage, this thing 2,000 years ago, Jesus' conversation here with these guys, that it's so relevant today in our culture right now today. It's radically relevant. I'm always amazed by that. I'm not surprised by how relevant the Bible is, but I am always amazed by it. It just blows me away. I appreciate it. I appreciate how it, it applies to my marriage. It applies to my anxiety. It applies to my prayer life. It applies to my interactions with friendships and uh, everything else. So here we go. Um, Mark chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus' discussion with the Pharisees, it goes like this. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Now, the first thing I want to notice with this little encounter is it says the Pharisees came out. They came out. The implication here is that they're, they're not just with the crowds. They're, they're not like part of the crowd, kind of going when the crowd goes to see Jesus. They're part of that crowd. They're always seen as someone, like a group that's sort of separate from the crowds. They're not kind of going with the people to check out Jesus. And they seem to always come with animosity. They come to cause problems. They come to challenge him in some fashion or another or to expose some error. In other words, they're not seekers. They show up occasionally and they show up adversarially when they're encountering Jesus. Uh, in Mark 3, 6, it tells us that already we learn this, that they were plotting to destroy him with the Herodians. Like they're actually planning already to destroy Jesus. So when they ask these questions, you know, what sign you know, do you do to prove that you are who you say you are? These, this is not a, a question that's meant like, really, we like to see, we like to know. It's rather meant to challenge, to refute, or to push against Christ. So the request for a sign is actually recorded in all four Gospels. So it's one of those rare moments that all four Gospels does talk about. It's combative. It's not actually testing Jesus. And that's key to understanding why Jesus has such an extreme response. Why he's like, no sign for you. I mean, this is a really extreme response from Jesus. But it's extreme for a reason. And we can learn from it. Okay. Um, verse 12. Sighing deeply in his spirit, Jesus says... Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Now, here's how some people, I think, have misunderstood this verse. And I think that they've applied it wrongly. So let me try and clear the air from that. Because this is not about everyone asking for proof. Show me Christianity is true. Ha, you fool. No sign for you. No evidence for you. That's not like a good pat response to people who are asking for evidence. That's not the right thing to do. Um, some people use this phrase from Jesus, no sign for you. To, to say that looking for signs is bad in and of itself. Like it's inherently bad to ask for evidence. But that's, that's a little confusing because then we have stories in the Bible where like Mary, she's like, how will I know? Right? And then, you know, she's given a sign. You know, Zechariah, when he's like, how will I know? And he, they're like, you unbeliever. And they, he's struck uh, dumb, right? He can't speak. So we have, we have people asking the same questions, but with different hearts. And they're getting very different answers. So it's not like a one-size-fits-all thing. If looking for evidence or proof is bad, then I'm in trouble because I spend a lot of my ministry trying to add the evidence and the proof and the affirmations and the confirmations of the truth of Christianity into everything I do. And here, no sign will be given. Okay, so don't give any signs. But I don't think that's really the case. I think that evidence helps people. Lots of people have come to Christ through evidence. 
but lots of other people can see all that evidence and it doesn't make a lick of difference because it's not just evidence that's the issue here. And that's what we're going to get at tonight. Evidence is not enough. So I need to see here, to understand this passage, I need to see why Jesus in context, in context, isn't saying that evidence is bad. And so I disagree with those who come against apologetics, come against offering evidence for the truth of Christianity and use a verse like this. But I want to show why in the context you can't use this verse. Because ultimately I don't disagree because I like apologetics or because I like evidence, but because the context. So this is a good principle of ours, right? We, we, don't, we don't read into the text our opinion, but we, re- we read out of it what is already there. So Jesus, one major reason why we should think evidence is acceptable to Jesus, evidence is liked by Jesus, is he's already given a ton of evidence in the Gospel of Mark. Evidence that affirms who he is, right? He's cast out demons. He's healed the blind, the deaf, the mute. He's actually raised the dead already. He's done a whole bunch of things to kind of prove who he is. And as we read Mark, we see that the context of these things is, it's supposed to show you who Jesus is, right? Jesus does something and the audience is like, who is this man that he can do this? And how that even ties into his, his uh, nature as God with us. So we see evidence being offered regularly. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus heals a, a man with a withered hand right in front of the Pharisees. So he's giving them signs. He's giving them signs, right? We've read about how he says, so that you will know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. Get up and walk. What is he doing? He's like, here's proof. Here's apologetical proof of of the claims that I'm making. So um, there's another public miracle that Jesus did very recently in the Gospel of Mark, and that is he fed the multitudes. He fed the multitudes. He actually did it twice, right? And when he feeds the multitudes, obviously there's tons of witnesses of this great miracle that would tie directly into Jesus as the new Moses. As the new Moses. So then this is like fulfilling the Pharisees' request before they ask of it. Really, Jesus did this two times. So Jesus does a bunch of signs, even in the Gospel of Mark. He does a bunch of signs to show who he is. There's another reason why signs or evidence is not bad. Jesus actually encourages people to look at evidence to prove who he is. So he does the evidence to prove it, but he also tells you, hey, look, see the evidence? That'll prove to you who I am. I'll give you a few places where we see this. In John 10, verse 37 and 38, listen carefully to the words of Jesus. See if you can comprehend the logic of what he's saying, right? He says, if I'm not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. If I'm not doing the works of my father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. So he's like, even if you're not just taking my word for it, because he, he's God with us, like he has the authority to say, I am who I am, believe me, just take my word for it. But on our human side, how do we know, right? Like anyone can say that. So how do we know that Jesus is who he says he is? So he's doing these works. And so he even meets us there and says, if you don't believe me just on his own authority, believe because of the works. So he points to the works as evidence. In John 14, 11, we get it again. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So he's doing all these miracles in the first century that they had access to and knowledge of. In Luke chapter 7, we have another example of this. This is where John the Baptist is in prison, and he seems to go through a bout of serious doubt. Serious doubt about whether Jesus really is who he thought Jesus was going to be. So he sends his disciples to Jesus. He's like, are you the one who is to come, or should I look for another? And he's confused. He's, and now, he's willing to trust Jesus just at his word. Jesus could say, yep, I am. But instead, as you read in Luke 7, Jesus heals a bunch of people right there on the spot. And then he tells the disciples of John, go back to John and tell him what you've seen. And then he quotes Isaiah, right? The the blind see and the deaf hear and the mute speak and the the poor of the gospel preach to them. And so he's telling, this is really neat because what we have is miracles and fulfilled prophecy, two of my favorite apologetics for the truth of Christianity. Jesus is giving these to John as evidence to prove who he is. Now, if you took what Jesus says to these Pharisees like as a blanket rule for everybody, then Jesus would have to say to John, no sign for you, a wicked and adulterous John asks for a sign or for some sort of confirmation of who I am. But, and John, think what he had already. John had, uh, not only did he have the Old Testament, did he have, you know, testimony of things that Jesus had done, 
He saw the Holy Spirit descend on Christ with his own eyes. He had God, you don't have this generally, right? God directly revealed to himself, hey, when you see this one and the Holy Spirit descends upon him, you'll know he's the one. So John, it seems to me, has more reason to believe than most humans have. And he doubts, but it's sincere. And Jesus meets him right there. Gives him evidence, gives him reasons, all that stuff. So sincere doubt, evidence, let's, let's give people help. They're confused, they're struggling, they're looking for help. Let's point to publicly accessible miracles as evidence of who Christ was. Of, say, his death and resurrection. Of uh, fulfilled prophecy in the scriptures. Let's, let's give people something to hold on to for those times where they're struggling, right? That, that's a good thing. That's a, I think that's a Jesus thing. I think, I think Jesus did apologetics right there in Luke chapter 7. So Jesus is not against showing signs. This is something else. This is something else. And there's three indications for that, right? The use of signs by Jesus. That's the first one we already talked about. But then there's two more. And that is in this passage itself in the context, he sighs deeply in his spirit. Meaning he's bothered by something. They ask for a sign and it's like really bugging him. He didn't do this with John. He didn't do this with other people at other times. But now it's really bothering him. And in the context, right, they've already got all these signs, all this evidence for Jesus, and they're rejecting it. Then the third reason, of course, is where he says, this generation, the this generation comment. So I'll come back to that in a minute. But just remember, he's like, why does this generation seek a sign? We'll come back to that. So why did Jesus sigh, though? Why does he sigh deeply in his spirit there in verse 12? I think the idea is disappointment. He's sighing like, oh, this is disappointing. He's living in the moment with the people, he's engaging with them, and he's sighing in disappointment. The request for another miracle or another sign is problematic because he just gave them a whole bunch of good reasons and they're rejecting him for things that have nothing to do with those reasons. It's not just fear, it's not just doubt, it's not just I'm struggling, it's rather a will to reject the truth of God, a choice to reject God's truth. It's a spiritually dangerous thing. I get this, for instance, in video comments on, on YouTube. I'll sometimes get comments from people, and I'm not angry about it. I just, I'm just pointing, don't, I'm not mad at y'all. I'm just saying, I'm just, it happens. Where the comments on YouTube are um, in videos where it shows that the person didn't actually watch the video or pay attention because they're like, I'm going to refute you. And then they put a comment down and I'm like, I dealt with that. Like, you know, all you got to do is watch a whole hour video to know what I dealt with. All right. Just <laughs> I know my videos are long, but, but yeah, you know, I just, I dealt with that. I, I dealt with that specifically in this video. How is it that you're asking? And a lot of times I'm thinking they did watch the video and they just, it just doesn't click. Like some, there's a brain block keeping things from clicking. So in, in, in a video I have where I'm dealing with uh, some atheist propaganda type stuff and I explain, you know, how history works, how historians treat topics and issues, and I have quotes from a historian to refute some, you know, typical atheist comments about history, showing that this is not how history works, and the comments are like, Mike, you still don't get it, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you know, I don't really know what to tell you, I don't know what to say at that point, um, when the Pharisees come up and they're still asking for evidence at this point, with that heart, it has nothing to do with evidence, evidence is a distraction, from the heart issues. So for Jesus to present them with more evidence doesn't fix anything. It just gives them one more thing to explain away. Jesus could heal a guy right there on the spot. Oh yeah, get up and walk. And they go, that guy was a plant. I think it was a plant. Show us another sign. All right, I'm gonna feed the multitudes again. I think his disciples were smuggling food in while he was doing that, right? Like he kept walking away and coming back with more food. I think that's what probably happened here. And it's just, all we're really doing is giving them more truth to reject at some point, and that's what Jesus is dealing with. He wants to deal with the heart of the issue. He disapproves of their motives because it's like they're building up an immunity to evidence, an immunity to proof. And sometimes that's what I see from uh, people who are really aggressively against the truth of Christianity is they build up an immunity to discovering the truth of Christ. And it's a very sad um, situation. As, as someone who does a lot of outreach and does, you know, apologetics, evangelism kind of stuff, I don't really know the right way to respond. I'm sometimes I'm like, should I just do what Jesus did? No sign for you. Why? Because your heart's all messed up. Because then they're like, yes, finally, you said my heart was messed up. Now I got to play my victim card. And you're talking about how mean you are and how you're trying to judge me. And, all, and I'm just like, I don't even, there's, it's like that, that conundrum in Psalms. Like answer the fool according to his folly, right? Or don't, an, don't answer the fool according. It's like either way, it's going to be a problem is the, is the issue there. So now we get to the idea of 
Why does this generation seek for a sign? Jesus says that. Why does this generation, this generation? What's unique about this generation? Well, it's good to know in the Bible, when you read the phrase this generation, it's not talking about now. We sometimes unintentionally do that, right? Like I read this generation, oh, it's talking about 2020. Right? It's talking about today. No, um, this generation was the generation when Jesus was walking the earth. After Jesus was right there in their midst, doing signs and miracles all over the place, proving who he was to thousands and thousands of people, demonstrating the truth of who he was. And now he's like, this generation's asking for a sign. What's the problem? The problem is they've already received more evidence than most people ever will. And they're still rejecting Christ. Jesus' own presence, fulfilling prophecy, meeting messianic expectations, uh, doing miracles. When people with the most evidence are asking for evidence, that's the problem. That's when you start to go, okay, something else is going on here. Something else is happening here. Evidence doesn't matter here. It's a distraction from the real heart issues that are going on. So here's some wisdom we get from this. Signs are good. And some people are really impacted by signs or evidence. I think signs are just evidence in this case. What sign do you do to show who you are? That's what they're asking. Signs is evidence. So so evidence is good, but evidence doesn't do it for everyone. And those people will often just keep asking for more signs or more evidence. And they'll say things like one of the common uh, atheist comments I get or agnostic comments I get is there is no evidence for God. And you're like, well, I, how about I give you, here's, here's one whole line of reasoning, carefully defended argument for God's existence using different evidence from philosophy and science. There is no evidence for God. Oh, okay, well, let's take the teleological argument. Are we going to take this? Or we're going we're gonna to argue this down using the design in the universe and the intricacies. How about molecular biology and just show that this was clearly, there's intent going on in what's happening. How about the, the existence of the human soul? And they go, there is no evidence. Okay, fulfilled prophecy in the scripture. And they go, there is no evidence. And so after a while, It's like the reverse of the emperor has no clothes. It's like they're running out there. There are no clothes on anybody ever, no matter, you know, and they start to see things that way. And this, I think, is a heart issue. And it's sad. It's not good. It's a sad thing. It's a heart condition that's going on. Let me give you one more reason why Jesus supports evidence. And it connects to this, like I said, this passage is recorded in four gospels. Let's look at the parallels of this Matthew, uh, Matthew and Luke. Um, In particular, we'll look at Matthew. We'll also look a little bit at Luke here. But Matthew chapter 16, it gives us another reason why why we should think Jesus does support evidence and that what he's really targeting is a heart issue. And that heart issue is actually very common. I would imagine more people, more people are, from my personal experience, more people are turning their back on God because of heart issues than evidence issues. I think that's probably the case. So here's the fourth reason. Matthew 16, verses 1 through 4. I'm just going to read read through this. It's our parallel passage. The Pharisees and Sadducees came up, and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, and this is the longer explanation. It's not the shortened version we get from Mark. When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times. So he's offering an analogy. He answers them with an analogy. He's like, look, you can tell the weather by looking at the sky, but you can't look at all the stuff going on right now in my ministry and see that I am the one. Right? You can discern the weather. That, and this is, this is actually what gets at the heart of skepticism. Modern skepticism has two sets of rules. One rule for proving things normally to be true and another set of rules when they deal with religion or Christianity, and they all of a sudden become super skeptical, right? Everything's, you have to have crazy amounts of evidence. It's like this sort of above the board, above any sort of logical, like if they took these rules and applied them to the rest of life, they would never know what the weather is. They would never know much of anything. They would just be like, there's no evidence for anything. There's no evidence for anything. That would be the response. And so uh, one of the things you can hopefully do to help people is you just say, hey, look, you're being inconsistent. It's just hard to be consistent as a a real skeptic or even an atheist. You apply the same things that make you an atheist to everything else in life. You suddenly realize you have no justification for hardly anything you believe because you're making an impossible rule for Christ or for God. So he says to them, yeah, you know the weather, but you you don't know the times. 
Verse 4, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. Except the sign of Jonah. So now we get there's more to the whole story here. What's the sign of Jonah? What is he talking about? Well, Matthew chapter 12, we get more info on the sign of Jonah. So Matthew 12, 38 through 42, it says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. And then he explains, for as just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that's an interesting translation, sea monster. It just, it just the, the term is indeterminate. It's a sea animal. We say whale or fish. Well, they didn't have these terms. There's like a more generic term for some big thing in the ocean. It would refer to a whale or an octopus or a something. You know, it's just like a big thing in the ocean. Um, <clears throat> so, so this is giving us the idea <clears throat> that Jesus is really referring to his death and resurrection. What's the one sign? I'm not going to give you a sign. Here I am in my ministry. At this point, I'm done proving myself to you. You've already rejected me. You're stuck in that rejection. Your last ditch effort will be when I die and rise. We'll see how you respond to that. That's kind of what he's telling them. The ultimate sign, the resurrection of Christ. Interestingly enough, the evidence for the resurrection is one of the best arguments for the truth of Christianity still today, after 2,000 years, because we have enough historical evidence still. I think that's so exciting. So let's look at some Jonah parallels because this is really interesting. When Jesus gives us himself in the Old Testament, so to speak, that's fun stuff. Um, Jonah was spit out of a, a fish of some kind um, and that was a sign to the people that God was speaking through him. It was, it was like his condition, whether his, he was looking crazy or whatever, there was something about this situation with Jonah that caused the people of Nineveh to be more likely to listen to him. And so with Christ, when he rises from the dead, you should listen to his words. That's the idea. It's a verification of the truth of his claims. Um, so how can, uh, how can someone say Jesus rose from the dead, but Christianity is not true? It just doesn't really follow logically. Now, I've heard some people try to say it. Oh, he rose, but you know that doesn't mean Christianity is true. So maybe people just rise sometimes. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, no sign will ever please you. You know, at that point, you, you can't follow the logic where it's supposed to lead you. Um, that's sad. But obviously, if Jesus rose, we have all of Christianity being true, hanging on the back of his resurrection. Jonah was sent to undeserving Gentiles. This is interesting because of all the prophets of Israel. He was sent to undeserving Gentiles. He didn't even want to go. He's like, I want those Ninevites to die. They're really, really bad people. That's why God was going to judge them. Jonah didn't want to go. He fled away from the presence of the Lord to, to not have to go to Nineveh because he just wanted them to die. He's like, if I go and preach, they have a chance to repent and you're gracious and you might forgive them. I'd rather just see them go down. So he flees, right? The undeserving Gentiles. Jesus brought salvation to people that these very Pharisees would rather see burn. They prefer to see those people burn. Jesus brings them salvation. So God's heart in sending Jonah is the same as God's heart in sending Jesus. And it wasn't understood by even Jonah. So here we have, you know, legitimate leadership in the people of Israel not understanding God's ultimate mission for the salvation of the world. Interesting parallel with Jonah. With Nineveh, judgment was already on its way. And believing Jonah and repenting was the only way to escape it. And with Jesus, it's the same. Judgment's already upon us. It's already coming because of our sins. God's delaying it, delaying it, delaying it, right? But if you trust in Christ and you repent, you can be forgiven of your sin. And so it's neat because Jonah didn't go and say, um, you all, Ninevites, y'all got to obey the Old Testament law. And then you can be saved, right? It was just repent. Believe me and repent. And Jesus is like, believe me and repent. Turn from that godless life to follow me. Trust. And that's it. It's not a law thing. It's, I think that's pretty interesting. So with Jesus, it's the same. Jonah was in this sea creature, whatever kind it was, for three days and three nights. It would really take a miracle for him to survive, wouldn't it? I think people are like, how did Jonah survive in the three days and three nights? And I'm like, that's kind of the point. That's what makes it a sign. Because Jesus didn't survive. He died. He spent three days and nights. Or, well, that's the idiom. And then rose again. As far as the idiom, I'll mention this real quick. Um, we have, and I have a video on this, on the supposed contradictions in the Bible. Uh, the phrase three days and nights is used multiple times in the Bible. We can absolutely demonstrate this to mean, um, even when it's just part of a day, they would just use the phrase three days and three nights. 
I know that sounds weird to us because we don't have that idiom, but it's an idiom in their culture. So Jesus probably died Friday, rose Sunday, but they they would call that. So they have times where like Daniel's like, I'm an, I uh, or somebody, I can't remember who it was, they were fasting for three days and three nights. They go, I was fasting for three days and three nights, and behold, now it is the third day. Wait, you were, if you fasted for three days and three nights, now it's the fourth day, right? But they're like, behold, and now it is the third day. But they talk about it like it's already been accomplished because that's just what they would do. Any section of the day was treated like a whole day. Um, Anyway, so there's the, uh, the the timing of it all. It would ultimately take a miracle. Jesus would be buried for that same uh, amount of time. In Luke 16.31, though, we get a revelation of from Jesus of the problem with even the resurrection. Why even the resurrection of Jesus might not change people and have them following Christ. Even if they become convinced that he really rose. Luke 16.31 says, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets... They will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. The issue with following Christ isn't just about the truth of Christianity. It's about whether you want to follow Christ or not. And the constant request to see more evidence and see more evidence and see more evidence, there's a, there's a point at which Jesus is just like, there's no more for you. This isn't an evidence issue. This is a heart issue. Now, I don't really know when to do that with people. I really do. I feel rude. I don't know their hearts. Jesus actually knows their hearts. He's got like this, this skill that I do not possess. He could be, call people out. Hypocrite. You know? And I'm like, I don't know for sure what's going on in that person's heart. You know, they're asking for evidence. I'll try to give them evidence. But there's, but I'm, I'm sure I've banged my head against the wall many times trying to give people reasons and reasons and reasons when it had nothing to do with reason. It had everything to do with desire. And the Lord knows. The Lord knows when, the, when to do that or when not to do that. I really don't know. But Jesus does offer his death and resurrection with this Jonah example. His death and resurrection is like the ultimate miracle, the ultimate sign to prove who he is. This is like the ultimate sign. And I think that, um, uh, like I said, the beautiful thing is we have the evidence for it today. So let me tell you, let me tell you a, a, a story about Gary Habermas. Um, how many of you guys know Gary Habermas? Familiar with the name? Gary Habermas, he's a scholar. He's, he's actually a very well-respected historical Jesus scholar highly respected around the world. Gary Habermas decided he wanted to build a case for the resurrection of Christ using, um, using history. Except he realized that when he was trying to prove Jesus rose to non-believing, even thoughtful guys, even scholars or historians, that they would want to dispute every little detail about the life of Christ. And so as he's trying to gather all his evidence, they would want to pick apart each piece of the evidence. And so, at least as I understand it, my understanding of how this, how this happened is he's like, well, what if I only take the pieces of evidence that historians have a, um, a consensus on, over 90% agreement? And I, and I, even if something's true, but if I don't have over 90% of historians agreeing on it, I won't use it as evidence. So he'll only gather like the, the most solid, the most absolute confident things, the historical bedrock about Jesus. And so he gathers these historical bedrock pieces and then he builds what he calls his minimal facts case. Minimal facts doesn't mean this is all that's true about Jesus. It just means, hey, can we at least agree that the consensus will hold to and then say what happened, what explains these facts? Like Jesus um, being crucified under Pontius Pilate. The, his, he actually had real disciples who believed that they saw him alive from the dead. That James and Paul, who were who had rejected Christ during his life, and Paul, who was an enemy of Christ, became converted after thinking that they had seen Jesus alive from the dead, that they seemed to be sincere in these beliefs based upon the lives they lived. So he just starts to piece together these kind of minimal facts. He actually has a number of minimal facts, but he gathers them together and then says, now let's talk about historically, as historians, what's the best explanation for these facts? Well, Jesus, he, uh, he had a twin brother. Okay, well, that falls short for all sorts of historical reasons. Um, I don't know how his twin brother convinced James, his brother, that he was the risen Lord, but James didn't follow him when he was alive. Um, yeah, that's a little confusing. Um, okay, Jesus, he didn't really die on the cross, right? He swooned. Well, historians have really thrown this out. The swoon theory is mostly dead, right? It's most, mostly dead. Right? That's, that's what it is. And, um, and people don't pay attention to it. And for the most part, so that swoon theory seems to be out. We have wild theories that come up. Some people say, well, when Jesus was buried in the tomb, there was an earthquake, right? We have that in the text. And then the, there was a crack in the tomb and Jesus' body rolled down into the crack. And so later when they opened the tomb, they were like, he's gone. 
But they didn't notice like a human body sized crack in the wall and look down at it or anything. They just like, he's gone. And then the disciples must have what? Hallucinated? And in fact, hallucination is the number one promoted theory in response. But most historians, when they look at this minimal facts case, they won't even present an alternate hypothesis. They just go, yeah, we don't know what happened. Now, it's sometimes when you say we don't know what happened, I think that's totally legit. But when you have a number of pieces of evidence that are all best explained, that's, uh, you know, the explanatory power of the resurrection, they're best explained by Jesus' resurrection, and the other, re the other explanations fall way short, then you have explanatory scope, as in it, 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 it explains all these pieces of evidence, as opposed to only explaining two with this theory, three with that theory, one with that theory, and you have all these weird patchwork things going on. So you have explanatory scope, explanatory power. It doesn't, it's not ad hoc. It's not just made up on the spot, like the crack in the wall. And someone says, well, maybe the rock had special properties and his body dissolved super fast. Someone said that. And I'm like, how dumb do they think people were back then? Um, apparently pretty dumb. So, so we have these, these, these uh, reasons to believe Jesus rose from the dead. Explanatory power, explanatory scope. Uh, less degree of ad hocness, all that kind of thing. Well, that's not an I don't know situation. That's a this is the best explanation for the evidence situation. And so he presents this, but I would suggest to you guys this, that there's plenty of people who don't care what the historical evidence is. No matter what you bring, it's not relevant. So Bart Ehrman, who is a historian, he says about this that it doesn't matter how much evidence you bring, Historians are not allowed to say that a miracle occurred. Now, what if I was against black holes? And I said, it doesn't matter how much evidence you bring of black holes. Physicists aren't allowed to say that black holes happen or exist. Wait, that's, that's dogma. That's not like evidence. That's just dogma. It's what it is. And that's what we get sometimes. In fact, let me give you some more examples. Jesus gives us his ultimate miracle. We can build a case even today, even using, even stripping us of all kinds of true things just to show you the minimal facts and try to show you that Christ rose. <clears throat> but often you find out here that evidence would not convince anybody. Here's some examples. Peter Atkins, well-respected atheist, thoughtful guy, brilliant man. He was recently in a debate on Unbelievable. The um, Unbelievable is a uh, really interesting uh, Christian debate. Well, Christians and non-Christians debating online. And Justin Brierley, the host of the show, asked him, Peter Atkins, what sort of evidence could science or the physical universe present to you that would convince you that there is a mind behind the universe? Peter Atkins says, I find that a very difficult question. Brierley says, if the stars lined up to spell, Peter, please believe in me. Peter Atkins says, I'd put it down to madness. Then Hugh Ross, the guy he's debating in this particular uh, discussion, says, it sounds like, Peter, that there's no evidence that would persuade you away from atheism. And then Peter Atkins says, well, to be honest, I think that's probably the case. Think about this. There is no evidence that could persuade you away from atheism. It's not possible. There's no such thing as evidence. That, and he goes, yeah, I think that's probably the case. Then how does this discussion make sense when the whole discussion is about evidence for God? And he's like, there is no evidence that could convince me there's a God. Something's wrong here. Well, Peter Atkins is then asked a question by Justin Brierley. He says, in that sense, do you even have an evidence-based view if you're committed to atheism a priori? Or before the fact, before you look at evidence. Then Atkins says... I suppose, even if I died and was confronted with St. Peter saying, welcome to heaven, I'd probably think I was dreaming. Those are, you can check it out. I'll put a link in the video description. You want to see that conversation, you can check it out yourself. Um, Gary Habermas had a conversation with Ant Antony Flew, An Antony or Tony Flew, right? Antony Flew was like one of the most famous atheists of the, tw of the 20th century, the last century. Hugely famous, very influential, brilliant man. At the time, he was an atheist when they had this conversation. Later, he became a, a, a theist or a type of deist. I don't really know what he believed at the point at which he died, but he wrote a book about how he changed his mind because of molecular biology. He thought it, it provided real evidence for God. But at the time back then in this debate with Habermas, he was not open to the evidence. Here's their, some of their conversation. Habermas versus Flew. Um, he was asked, what would count as good evidence? 
And he couldn't come up with a good answer. So then Habermas asked him, is your view unfalsifiable? Now to a, a thinking mind or a scientific mind, to have a view that's unfalsifiable is, is kind of a negative, right? Like you can't prove it wrong. And then he started to kind of philosophize about things. And he says, well, the unfalsifiability of unbelief is somehow a different problem than the unfalsifiability of belief. Different set of rules for dealing with belief versus unbelief, right? Then, finally, he was pushed and pushed and pushed, kind of like Peter Atkins was, and he finally says this. I suppose I have an almost unfalsifiable disinclination to believe the resurrection story. He's like, I guess I just, I, I'm in disinclined. I'm just disinclined regardless of the evidence. Then why are they talking about evidence, right? This is what Jesus did when he was like, look, no sign will be given to you. This is a different issue. These are leading atheist thinkers I'm, not, I'm talking about. Um, Hume Hume wrote his, wrote his book, Argument Against Miracles, all that kind of thing. He said that no testimony of a miracle is ever to be believed. And he became hugely influential in the thinking of philosophers in our time even. Hume, David Hume. This guy said no evidence, no testimony of a miracle is ever to be believed. That's just a rule where you don't believe no matter the evidence. Who's closed-minded? At least Christians were like, hey, at least follow the evidence where it leads. And they're like, yeah, but what if it leads to God? No. No evidence can lead me there. Bart Ehrman, again, I mentioned him. He said his historians aren't allowed to conclude a resurrection happened because it would be a miracle. So no matter what the evidence, you're not allowed to say that. It's not that hard to see the problem with this thinking. Uh, Matt Dillahunty, had, he's a leading online atheist. He's not a scholar thinker, but he's a really influential online guy. He had a, a conversation with Mike Lycona where Mike Lycona offered him a hypothetical. He said, hey, Matt Dillahunty, would you believe in God? Or at least not even believe. He says, would you believe in an afterlife? If... On stage in front of you, someone came and chopped my head off, and you saw it happen. You knew I was dead. And then you see me later, my head's back on, I'm alive again, and I have a special message from your, your, your deceased aunt or loved one that only you and them knew about. And I tell you the message. And he goes, now would you believe there's at least an afterlife? And his answer, can you guess? He says no. Because it's stubborn unbelief. It's not about evidence here. Not about evidence. So um, I want to be careful here with, G with Jesus' words. You see how applicable they are today? Who are the modern Pharisees? In some ways, it's atheism. In some ways, it's agnosticism. In some ways, it's, it's the, I don't know, but I'm always going to not know, no matter how much evidence there is. <laughs> that's, that's unfortunately, in some cases, what it is. So I'm not saying everyone has the same evidence. Um, the Pharisees are in a particular good place for evidence. They have way more evidence than most people today have. But for those who do examine the evidence and do consider the evidence, and you see what's there, it should be compelling belief at that point. God only holds us responsible for the evidence we've actually been exposed to in this life. That's an important thing to know. We're not held responsible as though we watched him rise from the dead ourselves if we didn't. We're just held responsible for what he has revealed to us. We're only accountable for those, those types of things. We get this in scripture when Jesus puts woe on Chorazin and Bethsaida. He's like, hey, if the miracles done in you were done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. It's going to be worse for you in judgment than for them. Because they had way more evidence than Sodom and Gomorrah had. So God only calls us to be accountable for what we have been exposed to, what we've been made aware of. So I'm not saying that everyone has the same evidence or that everyone's held accountable to the same, um, as if they've had the same evidence. I am saying that there are all kinds of spiritual issues that factor into our requests for evidence. He calls them a wicked and adulterous generation. Certainly the Pharisees thought they were sincere God seekers. I'm a sincere seeker. How dare you say that to me, Jesus? But Jesus knows their heart. Now, I don't usually have the courage or the wisdom to know when to tell someone they're just being wicked and adulterous against God. You don't really care about evidence. But I do sometimes ask one question, which is this. Let's suppose Christianity was true. Would you follow Jesus? Follow him. Not just acknowledge his existence. Would you follow him? Would you yield your life to Christ? Follow Christ. Worship God. And if their answer is no, then I say evidence isn't your problem. Because even if it was true, you still wouldn't, you wouldn't come in line. You wouldn't yield your heart and life to Christ. That's a different issue. So I have asked that question before and found it to be something that helps people realize. Because they don't realize they're doing it, usually in my experience. It's, it's, it's not self-aware that they're rejecting these things like that. But some people, when they reject Jesus and say, I'm just being rational, um, we can compare that to even testimonies from people who were non-believers, 
who after they got saved, they tell you, man, I was not rational. I said I was rational. I thought I was rational. But I'm telling you, I was not. There was all kinds of other stuff going on. I didn't want to stop my lifestyle. I didn't want to yield to God. I didn't want it to be true. And then you realize there's a, there's a different issue here. John 7:17, 7, Jesus says, If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. Speaking again of the will. Is my will desiring to yield to God? Then I'm in a much better position to see the truth of Christianity. But if my will is rejecting God, that might be why I can't see the truth of it either. My, my, my vision may be skewed by my will. So the will is the issue, not the intellect in this case. I wonder if the atheist said, I really am willing to believe in God. If at least more, if you took 100 atheists who say, nope, no matter what, I'm rejecting God. And 100 who said, no, I'm really willing. I really want to see the evidence. I don't know how genuine their hearts are. They don't know how genuine. How often do we really know our hearts? But I'll bet more of them would get saved. You know, I'll bet more of them would give their lives to Christ and respond to the evidence. So uh, not trying to be rude or mean or cruel or any, anything like that. Um, but if you're saying, okay, Mike, that might be me. That might be me. Like I'm listening and I'm thinking this is, it's a will issue. I've been pretending it's evidence. I actually thought it was evidence issue, but I think you're right. I think it might just be my will. What can I do? And I think the, the call in scripture is not to condemn you. The call in scripture is to make you aware of this so you can humble yourself and start seeking the Lord and start praying and asking God, Lord, I think I'm just unwilling. Help me with this. Please meet me here. Meet me here. Help me out. My heart is hard and I don't want, but maybe I want to want, you know, I'd like to like um, help me here and start seeking the Lord because if you humble yourself, God will draw near to you. He promises it in his word. And certainly there's no downside if, if you're wrong. If Christianity is wrong, you humble yourself and seek the Lord. It's not like something bad is going to happen to you. <laughs> Why not just humble yourself, seek him, and see if your eyes become open? Now, I want, I want you to give you guys a contrast though because I don't want to create a, a one-dimensional view of unbelief or doubt. So let's turn to Mark chapter 9. We'll close on this. This is a whole different scenario. Jesus encounters a guy who's struggling with belief and he, and he deals with them completely differently than the Pharisees. You know the passage, but I think it's really neat. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. We'll read all the way through 27. I'm letting you get there. All right. When they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought, uh, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him immediately, the spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth and he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And notice what he says, if you can. Says, if you can. I want help, but I don't even necessarily trust that you can. He's kind of somewhere on the fence when it comes to belief. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Look at the guy's response. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. You schizophrenic man. Like what's wrong with you? You do believe? Help my unbelief? I believe, but I don't believe at the same time. Now I think a ton of people are like, oh no, I know exactly what that's like. I know exactly how that feels. And this is not the Pharisees that Jesus has rebuked. This is a different guy, isn't he? He's like, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Here's me. I'm open, Lord, I'm willing, but man, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I'm dealing with doubt. I'm not, I don't have certainty, but I'm reaching out to you. And look at what Jesus says. <clears throat> um, I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit and said to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into a terrible convulsion, it came out and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up and he got up. How did, here's Jesus. I can heal him if you will believe. 
Here's him. I believe and I don't believe at the same time. Help. And here's Jesus. That's good enough. And he heals him. You mean I don't have to have total perfect certainty as a Christian to have faith? No. No. I mean, it's good. It's nice to feel super confident and strong. But you can also be really staggering and weak. And the Lord meets you there and he will, and he will accept you and embrace you. Because belief and unbelief coexisting is different than rejecting Christ. And that's, that's something he accepts. <clears throat> if this is you, then God meets you there. If your posture is like, my arms are folded, prove it. Prove it to me, God. Prove it to me. That's... Good luck with that. That's an attitude issue. That's not an evidence issue. But if you're here, I think that Jesus meets you there. And there's one other example I'll give to just, I want to round this out. I don't want us to think of people as two-dimensional. We're three-dimensional people. We go through all kinds of different situations. One week we're this way, one week we're that way, you know. <clears throat> in John 1, verses 45 through 51, we meet someone who's kind of in the middle ground. They're a little bit like obstinate, like, pfft, like doubting, but then they see a piece of evidence and they immediately become convinced. Right? So they're, they're a different scenario than the Pharisees. In John 1, 45, we read about that his name is Nathaniel, right? He's one of the disciples. In John 1, 45, it says, Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Through Moses in the law, they all wrote of him. He's the, he's the one, right? He's the Messiah, basically. And Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? This is like a, a scoffing, mocking phrase. It seems that way to me, right? Like he's kind of like, <laughs> Jesus. Oh, so you're telling me something like first century Jews saving the world huh, from our sin. Is that what you're telling me? Like it's kind of that attitude. But there's an openness in Nathaniel because Philip says to him, come and see. He asks him to be open to the evidence, right? Come and see, come and see, come and check out Jesus. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Okay, this is obviously knowledge a human couldn't have. Now this... To a later, to a you know, 21st century audience, you're like, well, how do I know they didn't just write that? But look, Nathaniel wasn't struggling with that at all, right? He's there at the time. Jesus is like, I saw you under the fig tree. And he's like, oh. And he realizes he's in the presence of someone who he underestimated greatly. So Nathaniel, he responds. And he says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And he's like blown away. It's like coming ac across... Uh, uh, king, the, the young king, when he pulls the sword out of the stone, you know, you're like, oh, you're the one. I thought you were just this scrawny little, we were watching that movie the other day, so I can't help. Arthur, right? Arthur? Richard. I forget. I wasn't paying very much attention to it, apparently. Um, so he's like, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the, the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, which is actually a passage we're going to come to really soon in our uh, studies through the Gospel of Mark. Um, so to them, to the people in sort of the middle ground, I'm really am open, I'm skeptical, but I'm really open. Seek, seek, but vet your heart that you aren't resisting God himself because this is not just information about the truth of the world you're getting. It's a, it's a response to the offer of relationship with God through Jesus, which confronts my sin, and i got to deal with all my issues, the whole person responds to the gospel, not just the mind. Not just the mind. So evidence is there and evidence is good. The real issue, though, will come down to my will. So take care of your will. Be willing to yield to God, to give your will over to him, and you'll be in a better position to find truth, even if it might be a struggle, even if it might be a, a season of struggle and a hard time. Take care of your will. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you'd help us to see our, our problems, uh, the issues of our own wills, um, where we might be becoming proud, uh, we might be proud, we might be arrogant, inconsistent in the way we handle truth, causing us to reject things that we would just, ultimately, we've come to a place where we'd rather not believe that, we'd rather not yield to that. Lord, help us, help us to not think that we're, we're just, we're Commander Spock, we're just logic choppers and we just always follow truth wherever it leads, but to realize we're, we're full people with all of our influences and all of our issues and, and it's so important for us to just be yielded to you, God. 
So show us. Show us where we have errors. Show us where we're wrong. Help us to see the truth of God. Help us to grow. Help us to be humble. And help us to be recognizing where our own spiritual issues are being, uh, are, are the things that are influencing us and we're, we're getting distracted by excuses. We pray you'd help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.